difficult. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, for quick little housekeeping, uh, for those of you, I know probably most of you have already used Zoom, but just a little heads up. So we are asking everyone to please um, mute their microphones and turn off their videos just during the webinar presentation to limit any distractions. Um, if this is your first time using Zoom, you'll notice if you put your cursor over your screen, you will actually have a toolbar, a little um, Zoom toolbar that comes up. You have the options to mute, turn off your video in that section right there. You'll also find a chat option, which is we the, the place Place, we encourage you to please type in any questions that you may have. Feel free to type in any questions as we are presenting. Uh, we will hold some time towards the end of our presentation to open it up where everyone can turn on their mics and begin to ask questions um, regarding the what we're presenting today. So uh, again, uh, we also have closed captioning today. We have a live closed captioner. If you need those uh, if you need that particular um, service, we have uh, Karen um, A in in our in our chat. If you would like to contact her, I believe you can find her under Karen. If you can help me out here, CBC OEI webinars. If you send her a direct link, she can help you um, set up the closed captioning. And then there's also an option on the toolbar to turn on the closed captioning option as well. So um, just a little heads up. We are recording this webinar, so you will have access to the recording. Um, just give us a few days to get it closed captioned and ready to go. Okay, so let's get started. So again, welcome. Uh, today we'll be talking about online mental health and wellness resources for our California Community College students. We will reference a specific tool, uh, Wellness Central, and you'll get a moment to, to learn a little bit more about what that tool is and who is providing this particular resource. Awesome, so let's start by taking a look at a quick video. Um, this is about our students and where they are and um, due to COVID, just how are they feeling and what are they sharing with us? So I'm gonna click on here, please let me know. I'm gonna stop sharing really quickly and begin the video in just a second. Let's see here. Please let me know if you can see this. Yep. Yes, we can see it. These are humans, more specifically young humans. We believe their story matters. So during this global pandemic, we wanted to stop in and ask, what has this been like for you? It's really been sucky. <laughs> it's definitely sucked. I can't complain. Yeah, of course it sucks. Yeah, that really sucked. A lot. I missed out on my whole tennis season, which I can't. That's not, that's not too bad. I used to, you know, have a bunch of people come over and we would drink hot chocolate and watch Netflix together. This year we had jazz band for the first time in a long time. And so I had to miss on performing that for our concert. I miss hugging my friends. <laughs> now it's just the work and not any of the fun stuff. I've lost. Um, I see me here. <laughs> uh. I lost prom. 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 That's something I missed. I'm not working my serving job anymore. I've had my good days and my bad days. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> school has been weird. Finneytown High School has now become Finneytown Homeschool. I strongly dislike learning from home. I'll try to start schoolwork Monday through Fridays, check all the Google Classrooms and the Schoology's and the 13 different platforms that we use and figure out if there's a meeting. It's led to a lot of stress and anxiety. I feel like I have a loss of hope almost. That's definitely been a lot of stressful thoughts about it. I'm not learning anything. <laughs> no. Well, I never knew how good I was at procrastinating until now. It feels like time doesn't exist. Days are kind of all slobbed together. I definitely have felt guilty for feeling any sort of uh, sadness about what I've missed out on. This is weird and it's okay to feel like this and you have a reason to and you're allowed to. All of our feelings are valid. All of our emotions and stuff, they, like, they're real. And we're, you know, we're allowed to have them. So being told that it's okay to have a problem and to feel that way can be the first way to start solving it. Honestly, it's just sad. It's okay to be sad and it's okay to be hurt and it's okay 
to feel the way you do because your feelings are extremely valid. This has never happened before in our generation or in our lifetime. To feel like your feelings don't matter is completely wrong. I talk to my mom a lot. <laughs> Journaling helps a lot, like writing everything down. FaceTime calls and friends and family, and I'm making sure I water my plants. I've choreographed dances. I would film right in front of my garage, actually, and like post on Instagram, try to like spread positivity during this crazy time. I know that that first meeting and those first hugs are gonna be really awesome and needed. <laughs> you are human, which is good news because it means you have permission to be human. And as a human, it's okay to not be okay. My apologies, I couldn't get the YouTube to turn off. <laughs> so it's okay not to be okay. And uh, it's okay to not be okay is really just resonating with a lot of us, right? Not just our students, but our ourselves. Uh, I include myself in this um, notion of accepting, right? Feelings that we have during this time. And so I wanna also take a moment to ask everybody in this room, if you feel comfortable to share in the chat, how are you doing? How are you feeling about working remotely, online, virtually? Is this new to you? Have you been doing it before? And it's very different, right? Because it's not just working remotely, but it's working remotely during a pandemic. And so we want to take that moment. And if, again, no pressure, if you feel comfortable, would like to share, um, we'd love to hold this space to really share our emotions, our feelings, and, um, you know, validate each other because this is real. These are real feelings and just how these students have shared with us. It's okay um, to acknowledge these feelings. So I'm going to take a moment, pause, and uh, give space for everyone in this room, virtual room, to share with us, you know, what are some of those feelings that you, that you would like to share? Depends on the day. Feels great. Love being remote. Some days are very isolating. It's hard, a lot of work, a lot of things to keep track of. Gotten used to it, it's fine. It helps with having contact outside the home. Miss students and campus energy. Don't mind being cozy at home on rainy days, that's true miss my colleagues and being able to just bump into people. Stressed, frustrated, surviving, it's good. I wanna thank you for, for sharing that with all of us in this space. Because I think one thing that we can agree on is that for the most part, a lot of us may be sharing, right? These emotions and feelings and experiences. We are all, doing the best that we can. And we have all been asked to really tap into a new way of doing things. And so I just wanna take a moment and just thank you all. Thank you for the work that you're doing for yourself, for our students, for people around you. I know someone shared you have children. I'm a mother too. I know the stress that comes with balancing everything. So I wanna just thank you. Thank you for being you. Thank you for being in this space. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for helping others see, right? That we're not alone in these feelings. Thank you so much. Feel free to keep sharing if you, if you would like to do that. 
So now I'd like to introduce my colleagues who will be presenting today. I have a lovely Laureen Campana. She is from HSA CCC, Health Services Association for California Community Colleges. And Laureen is our Wellness Central Lead, Coordinator for SHSP and Columbia College. She works at Columbia College as uh, the Director of the Health Services. And we also have a good friend and colleague, Dr. Anita Porter. She works with us at CVC OEI, a California Virtual Campus Online Education Initiative. She is our Online Student Equity Specialist for Student Experience. And my other lovely friend and colleague, Bonnie Peters, also working for CVC OEI, and she is the Chief of Student Services Officer and Director of Student Experience. So now I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, um, Laureen Campana. Hi, everyone. First of all, greetings. Greetings and thank yous. Um, I think it was beautiful to start off with both the voices of our students, followed by the voices of ourselves, because what we're going to talk about is human connection. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I want to thank you for being here and taking part of your valuable time to focus on this topic. We are all in service of students. That's why we are here. Um, we understand that as a joint effort. Um, and I want to acknowledge that we miss each other. I think we see that in the chat. We, we miss our students. We miss each other. We miss our families. We may be tragically missing from the loss of um, people from uh, loss from COVID. So I just acknowledge that also. And I want to say that I hope you obtain something useful to take back with you from this time that you're spending here. So, uh, and one last thank you to Anita, excuse me, well, our Anita will, who will be coming, Bonnie and Jessica for putting this webinar together for CVC OEI. So um, I am in the middle of a storm in middle um, foothills of Sierra Nevadas. If I suddenly disappear, it's because our power went out and I know that my colleagues will pick it up. So I wanna give that um, bit of a warning. Uh, I wanna tell you a little more about my background. I'm a nurse practitioner. I have a master's in public health. I have been the college uh, health services coordinator at Columbia for 20 years. I have worked with the Health Services Association of California Community Colleges as their president. I have visited over 27 of our campus health centers and colleges. So I have an idea of what's out there and what you, where you may be working. And I'm also um, an adjunct teacher in three different departments. So I, I teach. So with that, those are my lenses. And I want you to know that. And one last lens is that I have a fellowship in integrative medicine. So I'm looking at uh, our students in a pretty broad way. So we're looking at mental health today. We're looking at how to connect with our students in the online environment on mental health. What tools do we have? And we always start with some data and background and this will, none of it will be surprising to you. Um, the Student Senate of the California Community Colleges uh, surveyed uh, our student bodies, received over 1600 responses and found that students are stressed. 67% um, are feeling anxiety, stress and depression while 41% said they're doing okay. And a loss of income is a significant Factor, and we're going to get into where that fits in the holistic realm of student experience. Go to the next slide. Uh, again, um, the report on student mental health. Um, this is pre-COVID information. We know that one in four students have already been uh, diagnosed with a mental illness. And I think that we know that our community college students are at greater risk for many reasons. And these, again, we can imagine post COVID, we'll see the data of what this looks like. Next. Here is where we want to create the link. We want to get the connection, make the connection between where our students must live now and where we must live, which is online. So how do we connect our students with 
the resources that they need with the tools that we have. And here we see this was four years ago, and I imagine this hopefully data is a little improved, but faculty and staff don't often know where to find or uh, a resource to send or connect with a distressed student. Um, that just three years ago, we still noted that we needed more staff and support around mental health, and that has not changed. Next slide. So how are our health and mental health practitioners doing? How has COVID impacted our health and wellness departments? Well, this Health Services Association of California Community Colleges, which is um, an association of volunteers, uh, mostly directors and staff of the 114 California Community Colleges, although you'll see that many of them do not have a health services program. They sent out a survey in the spring of 2020. The total of it is in a link here, and we're going to look at a bit, few of the data points from that survey. What's the next slide? So there's a couple of key points I want you to note from this information on this slide. So we have 114 community colleges. Now the next arrow says we have 80 of them with student health services. That's right. We have a significant portion of our California community college system that does not have an umbrella of health services, either as a brick and mortar clinic or a program. That represents over 100,000 students. And I think here is where we may begin to consider and mull over the equity questions. We had 68 of our um, <clears throat> campuses uh, sent the, that are part of the health services listserv, 51 responded, but we're representing 64% of the uh, student population. So we have a good response rate. So let's take a look at what some of the results were. As we all know, the huge push is to online. It's online, online. And while pre-COVID, we had 2% of our uh, student health services using an online platform to serve their students, either in with their uh, clinical services or their mental health services, that bumped up to a whopping 88% because this is where we are going to find our students. Um, and there's still 10% of colleges that of those surveyed that don't have even a telehealth connection for their students. Next slide. So in the survey, the student survey, the students told us what they wanted at this time. This is post COVID information. You can see they want reliable, valuable, valid connections in the online environment that's where they lived before, but they live there even more now. And we hear the poignancy of those students in the initial video of how despondent and what they're struggling with. So this is what they want from us. Next slide. I won't read all these. So we have a widespread telehealth model, um, pre-pandemic fewer, post-pandemic, there's still those 10% of colleges that need to bring an online presence for their students. And I will say that the Health Services Association is a advocacy and a uh, helping organization, and they will reach out to those colleges. And if um, those colleges need to reach out to us, it'd be, um, we'd be welcome to try and see how we can help Finding HIPAA compliant platforms is really important and they are out there, Zoom has one. But uh, HSA is committed to bringing services, health services to all our students. Next slide. So um, these are the platforms that are being used. HIPAA compliance is important. DoxyMe, Cranium Cafe, Zoom, they're all free. So those are, um, I think the others, I'm not sure, ConnectSed is free also. So there are ways to do this. There way, are ways to do this um, without expending more precious resources. Next slide. 
Ah, oh, thank you. Connect no longer free. Yeah, keep keep me up to date. Um, this uh, information also comes from um, the HSA survey. What are the top requests that students are communicating that they need? Now we're going to look at the student perspective from a term that is overused, but I think it does help us give a reference point and that's holistic. We will be looking at the whole student and I love the fact that that uh, video started by recognizing that we're human beings. We're human beings with um, a uh, complex and variety of needs and what falls under the health umbrella is something that we can recognize as being holistic. When we look at these top needs to the far left, we see mental health as the main need that students recognize and what their actually student health centers are recognizing students are asking for. But if you look down and go further to the right, you see basic needs of food and housing, prescription refills, sexual and reproductive health. You can stack when we look at health. We're focusing on mental health right now, but I'm going to say right up front, I feel we do a bit of a disservice by focusing on single parts of the whole. And I'll talk a little more about that. I feel that mental health is significantly needed right now, but it's not un or disconnected from the physical or social health that people uh, that we need to focus on as well. Um, and the next slide. So we're going to talk about this holistic model. And again, I, I will just say that I've been taught this model since I was an undergrad in nursing school. Um, I don't know if I mentioned I'm a product of Sacramento City College, California State University, Sacramento, and UC Berkeley. It's, so I've been, had my toe in all of all the higher ed California systems. And what I want to say is this holistic model that I learned some time ago has been the one true thread throughout my whole decades career as nursing that has rung true. And we look, use this model to create the tool that you'll see Wellness Central. So as a background, this model was data driven and theoretically based. Uh, if you're familiar with the RP group, Student Success Redefined, those six um, points of success were considered when we created the modules and the design of the program. We used a motivational interviewing format instead of a directive uh, information pushing format. We wanted students to feel invited to explore and find what they needed and um, in a way that encouraged them to to expand and, and use the source um, <clears throat> exactly where they're at. We used an easy single front page newspaper design, and this is where our wonderful instructional designers from CDC OEI helped create the structure of the platform, partner with us remarkably um, in uh, enthusiasm and um, creating this for students. And we didn't want students to have to do a lot of digging or to take a whole nother course, so to speak. So it's all on one page. Every module is designed exactly the same. So if they go to a different topic, they are going to see the same setup. Um, we use student focus groups to take a look at it and uh, the results were uniformly positive. We did use the hashtag real college survey data and the American College Health National College Health Assessment survey data for which we have a cohort of California community college data. This is the only unique piece of health data that we have for our system that was is held by the Health Services Association. And this was, I think about four years ago or maybe more, we had over 17,000 um, student responses unique to California community colleges. So with this data, then we decided on the formatting and the topics of the modules. Next slide. So there are health and wellness modules. 
They, uh, the sub theme for Wellness Central is your space at your pace. We know that students um, need health information and issues when we don't have office hours. They may need to look at something at two o'clock in the morning. Their anxiety may be peaking at midnight. Um, they need to know that they're safe when they look at something. So Canvas has 24 seven access. It's anonymous. We don't collect data from it except um, what college they come from and what's, if they're a student. Each of the modules brings in information that is customized to California Community College students, links to um, internal references um, and uh, resources. Um, we've used a variety of modalities to link students in, videos, and the videos are, are, are there's a series of videos within um, Wellness Central that are of California Community College students talking to other California Community College students about the topic, per, perhaps anxiety or hunger or um, academic wellness. There's articles, websites, apps, and on every single page, there's a link for the student to get immediate help through the crisis text line. And there's a link that they can find within their um, their county and their college, there's a links to every single health services department if they have one, mental health services department if they have one, and then if they don't, we've also added every uh, county um, public health department and mental health department. So it's a place for them to start to, that they can find some connection to help even if they're we aren't able to meet them at the moment in real time. Next slide. So I want to show you the list of the modules because this is a unique list among health, college health from my experience. And the reason is we have strongly pulled in a social health connection. And I want to address this and say that we Again, we do a disservice to our students if we only imagine that they need have physical or mental health needs and not address the social health because they are all intertwined. Um, physical health, I think we know everyone needs to pay attention to their diet and exercise. That's the easy one. That's something, although I will say from the American College Health Assessment Survey, 20% of our students are saying they are um, dealing with chronic pain. And the most common chronic pain is back pain. So you can imagine, and again, what we're talking about here, and I'll back up a bit, is that we are looking at the health barriers to academic success. So we're trying to determine how to either enhance health or remove barriers. So when we think about these topics, we're thinking about them in those terms. Our focus is students and academics, although we are all of course interested in humanity in general, that's why we do what we do. Mental health is a, we bring it down again to a more personal experience, although we certainly have situational issues for individuals that lead to um, issues for mental health. We have uh, um, organic intrinsic issues that lead to me mental health. People need medication, situationally isolation. There's a lot going on on that regard. We need to support students in that regard and we'll hear more about what that looks like, but you can see well uh, integrated into the modules are mental health issues. And now we need to look at social health. The Nurse Practice Act for nurse practitioners in the state of California says that I can diagnose and treat physical, mental, and social health issues. And I will say that physical and mental was probably much stronger um, in my educational background, but social health really picked up the pace when I went and got a master's in public health. And these are the interventions that are the most difficult. Um, they bring in the issues of equity. Uh, they require more upstream interventions. And I'm gonna tell you what that means in public health. I apologize if you know the story, it's probably one that we're mostly familiar with, but it is the image of um, a town alongside of a river and suddenly 
uh, we're finding that people are falling in the river and drowning. And so a large contingent is created at the site of these folks that are in the river. There's ropes brought, there's human chains. We're pulling people out, rescuing them, covering them with blankets, taking care of them, giving them hot tea. And this constant process of pulling people out of the river, out of the river, out of the river. Someone walked up the river a ways and found that the issue was a bridge that people walked over regularly to deliver goods to the town or for whatever reason had a hole in it. And as people walked, it was a hole that they couldn't see very well. And so they would drop through before they knew it and ended up downstream. Now, the best solution of course, is to fix the bridge. But that fixing of bridges when we look at issues in social health is where things become difficult. We run into issues of equity, social justice, institutionalized racism. What is needed to give up equity, to give up to acquire equity and social health is a big question that we need to hold on to. It is where the greatest resistance occurs, but it is the most necessary. So I just want to give that plug that I, uh, my uh, lens on that particular part of how we look at health. Um, another, go ahead and do the next slide. So, um, I have another another talk about the equity piece, but here is um, here is what it looks like. This is, when I was teaching last spring, and we had to go online, my students disappeared. I lost them. I was reaching out with every contact that I could, but probably about over about over forty percent. I just couldn't find. And this is what happened with the health centers. We had all of a sudden no connection. Our students weren't using these online platforms that we had. We weren't connecting with them. And it was devastating because we would see the issues that they were telling us they needed help with and we couldn't get to them. So that's another reason why we're really hoping that you find these online services. And now we're several months into this and we still have several months to go in this pandemic and in, in this COVID era that we're in. So we were losing our students. So the next slide. So Wellness Central was created. So Wellness Central um, was actually created pre-COVID and I'll just give you a little background on it. Um, Wellness Central, when we listened to students and talked to them, and I was working in the classroom at the time, and students kept telling me they needed to be on Canvas. Everything needs to be on Canvas. And I was like, why does it need to be on Canvas? We're a face-to-face -face class. They said, oh no, we're, everything we do is on Canvas. And as I was looking through Canvas and talking to my students and looking at the platform, I thought health services need to be on Canvas. We need to be there also because this is where our students live. And so pitching that at the state level with our CDC OEI partners who enthusiastically joined us, we created this Wellness Central um, <clears throat> platform that can be uh, put in your, um, there we go, put in your uh, Canvas platforms either right on the navigation bar of the students uh, for the students, I have um, Ohlone College telling me that they have it in the help section of their uh, of their Canvas uh, platform. Um, so we created this, and we so we have this link. And I want to tell you another story about how it's used. The idea, of course, we continue to look at how are we helping the students. So if you could enter that and open up um, first generation, uh, we can take a look at that one, I think. Um, so here's the opening page and you can see on the opening page and on every page is the link to crisis text. We are creating a new module on COVID-19 and we are going through the, the whole 
program right as we speak, just checking links, updating as we need. The students can enter in the module format that they're hopefully familiar with. The modules are alphabetical order and there are 27 of them. They can also look at it on a wellness wheel. Uh, you can see to the right, there's the wellness wheel and they have um, uh, the ability to look at the modules in that era area. So we have emotional, social, physical, academic, financial, and spiritual as what we have used as our model to looking at the whole human being. The top is a, I think, a mature set of photos that invites the student in. There's an overview of what students are telling us about this topic and how they might be helped. There's students talking to students, a video. Here's one of a group of multiple students talking about their experience as first generation. And I always find it moving. There's a few familiar faces there to encourage students about uh, other folks who have been successful, who were first generation. And then the bottom of each front page is um, divided into quadrants. The on the left are where students can dive into some very select resources that we've gone through. This was created by multiple health services directors and staffs, each of the modules. They can go dive into a couple of places that can get them really quick, important information. If they wanna go further, they go down to the explore more section and we have more in there. On the right of that page, Every single page has this connection to the local health and mental health centers near them, either at their college, their very college, or at their county, within their county. And then the last quadrant is, again, the crisis text information for every, on every page and two other resources, the California Community College Health and Wellness page and the Cognito, um, uh, programs, which are uh, modules, like more extensive modules where students can learn about how to help others, particularly general stress, veterans, LGBTQ. And so that is right there also. On the bottom of the page are a few links. Again, every page has the link to the local health. There's an accessibility um, feedback uh, boxes in case we need to update something and technical support. So this is how it's set up. And um, this was created all volunteer. I just want to say a, another piece about, um, about resources. This video on here is kind of uh, is charming. It was um, created as an intro. So if somebody wants to look at a video, and then again, here's the wellness wheel. Um, you can go to my next slide, Jessica. So the last thing I wanna say also is advocacy. We, we Health is advocacy. And um, I have spoken at the state level. I've been in Senate meetings and talked to folks about um, getting more resources for our students. We have 2.1 million students. We know CSU system has about 600,000. UC is about 300. Health resources for at the UC level is about $2,500 a year for students. Uh, the CSUs vary, but around 1,000. And you may or may not know, and both of those systems have mandated health services programs. California community colleges do not mandate a health services program on their colleges, and that's why for multiple reasons, and resources are not least among them, we don't have a health services for those students and about 100,000 students are represented, as I said. We receive $20 per student per semester if the college uh, has the fee program in place and if they charge the maximum fee allowed, which comes from a state budget office. So we're dealing with very few resources to serve the greatest number of students who appear to have the greatest needs for health. So I'm just gonna put that out there also and whatever advocacy we can do for our students on that regard, I am all for it. Do I have another slide here, Jessica? I can't. Wait, no, at this point we will transition over to Bonnie Peters and then okay. she can it on. So I just wanna say one thing, I'm gonna listen very closely to Dr. Ornita Porter today also and look forward to her presentation. Thank you so much. 
Okay, thank you, Laureen, and thank you, Jessica. Okay, hi, everyone. Um, I'm, my name is Bonnie Peters, and I'm with the CBC OEI. And what I wanna to talk to you about um, really is the getting access to Wellness Central and sort of go through some of the, the data that we've um, acquired since we've launched Wellness Central. And I, I, I wanna echo what uh, Laureen said with regards to the partnership when we were working together to put Wellness Central together. It was a lot of dedicated people and a really great partnership when they approached us about how can we help. We were very willing because this is all part of what we do, CBC OEI in terms of online services. And, um, you know, as the subject matter expert, they were able to provide all this great content. I mean, it's, it's interesting when, when a product is finished, it looks fantastic and it's all there and it was so much work. So I really appreciate the work that they put in to, to make this a really valuable resource for the system. That being said, one of the questions in the chat as Laureen was speaking was about how do we get access? So I wanted to talk about getting access to Wellness Central. Um, and there's two ways that, that it's possible at this point in time. When we created it, uh, um, when we worked on it and it was finished, the, the whole goal was to always make this available to the campuses. Right, and so as we worked on the operation, the technical side of things in terms of putting it in campus, in Canvas, and getting it using having uh, instructional designers to make sure all the accessibility pieces in place and it's laid out well and all of that. Part of this was always designed to turn over to the colleges so so that you can all incorporate this, this into your own Canvas instance. So in terms of accessing Wellness Central. There's two possible ways. And the preferred way is we would like you all to um, access, get, go through Canvas Commons, right? And download, you can just type in Wellness Central and you will be able to download it to, and have it um, placed into your Canvas shell. Now, I know you, you might be, let's say a counselor or a health service provider and you're like, wait a minute, I don't know how to do this in Canvas. Don't worry about it. There's two things happening here. Your, uh, you would need to speak with your DE coordinator or your Canvas administrator in terms of getting it into um, Canvas. Um, and the good news is when we launched at the end of 2019, all, uh, we, we created all the instructions. Um, our technical person did all the work and created all the instructions to um, uh, for downloading it, it from created uh, Commons and getting it into Canvas. And that information was shared with all of the distance ed coordinators in the system. Um, yes, it was the end of 2019. Some may remember, some may not. That's not a big deal. We can always, if you need that set of instructions, we can make that available to you as well. So the first and the preferred way, we would like you to create your own instance by going to Canvas Creative Commons and download it well the central. If at this point, um, that's not something your college is, is able to do, prepared to do, or you know anything like that, or perhaps um, just in your space, you're ready to kind of just get Wellness Central up and going, you can connect to the U URL, CBC, which is on the screen, cbc.edu wellness. And that will take you to that page that you saw where Jessica was when, when uh, we were going to show you Wellness Central, where you, put in the college name if you're a student or, or you know, other, and um, it takes you directly into the open public shell. So that will not be your controlled shell, that's the public shell that we put up on the cbc.edu. Um, the control shell that you would have would be the one that you would be downloading through Canvas Commons. The reason why we would prefer for you to do that is because that way you get to, to control uh, your own instance within Canvas. So that's the preferred way. And eventually, um, because this has to be ownership of the colleges, we really want all the colleges to, to accessing it that way. So that's, those are the two primary ways for accessing Wellness Central. Next slide. Um, to, get, to, to help you be successful in, in, in rolling this out. And again, even if it's on your campus already, Perhaps in your area, it, it, your, it, you know, it's in Canvas and, you know, maybe students know it's there, maybe they don't. One of the things where we like to encourage is that 
it's not necessary to only have a single access point. You can always link your Canvas URL to your own web page. So if let's say you're in the health service office, you can link it directly there. So we, we encourage you to, to have Wellness Central linked in appropriate places, even if it's your own Canvas shell. The other thing that we, um, and I won't go too much into this because that's a whole other presentation, but one of the one of the things that we've been working with colleges is that we're encouraging everyone to create an online student support hub. And many colleges have begun putting in Wellness Central within that hub, which is a centralized place where students can access services in terms of online student services. Um, and Wellness Central fits into that very nicely. So if your college has a hub already, that should be a place where students can access it, which is a sort of one-step um, point to go into um, when they're going to the, to the hub. We've created, and well, I should say we, but the partnership that with um, HSACC, see, uh, we've created a lot of um, uh, marketing material, put together a lot of marketing material. And that link that is on the screen, which I think um, can get placed in the chat. If you um, go to that link, you can download it, download the flyers, download the toolkits, download you know all that information. So we've tried to make it as um, less onerous on, on your part, you know, what creating the tool as well as giving you the marketing material so that you can make this really um, easy to, to launch at your uh, at your uh, college and your campus and with your students. So that's a really important um, piece for you to take a look at if you haven't been able to do so before. Next slide. So I, I wanna go through what we've discovered with Wellness Central in terms of the usage. And you remember Laureen mentioned that, um, you know, because this is about health and we're talking that holistic health, we don't gather any information on the students other than usage. And when we say usage, we're talking about access and that the person was a student and that's it. No names, nothing. And so um, we're looking at data. We, we launched basically kind of the end of 2019 and then, um, you know, that whole piece with COVID start happening and, and, and things kind of got a little crazy as we all know. And so we're looking at the data starting from March to now. And this is data, I wanna be really clear. This is data just from the, if, if a college had linked from the cbc.edu wellness site. This is not data from colleges that have, that downloaded the Creative Commons and, and created their own instance. So the number in terms of uses is considerably higher um, than this 3011. But this is, is really good data to, to have in terms of who's accessing and people accessing the site. So that was really, um, uh, it was really good to see that information. And I suspect with all the colleges who have already created their own um, version of it, the data from those colleges will show a greater increase, particularly through the month of March, from the month of March to now, in terms of students making use of it. We've had some really good um, feedback and we've had all different constituents at the college using it. We had a really great um, presentation from a, a chemistry instructor who incorporated it into her class and really looking at the student holistically. And that was a really um, reassuring and refreshing um, story to hear because with student services, we all sort of think about that. And we want instructors also thinking about that because instructors are the ones who are with the students, you know, when they're feeling a lot of this pressure and to know that instructors are thinking about it in the same way and using the resources that we created for the system is amazing. And that's, that's exactly where we want it to go. So next slide. So this is a, the 3011 broken apart and Again, because we don't collect anything other than usage, we have, if you remember on the screen, it, it said student or other. The other can be faculty, staff, anyone. And we wanted to differentiate between who's the students who access the site and if others were accessing the site. And so those, those are, when you add it up, that's the, the 3011 that we just sort of split. So we're seeing the heavy usage by the students, which is what we want. 
you know, when we say usage in terms of accessing and going and getting the information, and that's really good. Um, it's not like, you know, everyone else and the students are barely getting to it. And um, so we really, really appreciate um, knowing that the students are, are actually using and going to the site. The site. Next slide. Now this, this data, this piece of data here is very, very interesting because um, right now we have, you know, I know the previous slides at 114, we technically have 116 colleges, right? If you count Calbright, the uh, online college, and then I believe last year, um, uh, I think it's Madeira became a, a full on college. So it's, it's now 116 colleges in our system. And we have, um, uh, this data is telling us that 112 community college students, students from 112 community colleges accessed Wellness Central. So what that is telling us is that, and this is just from what we saw through, through the site. Again, we're not in, the, the, the colleges are uh, individual instance. So through our site, we, we were able to determine that out of all 116, we had students that covered 112 colleges. So what that tells us is that if, if, if right now you didn't know about Wellness Central, most likely, unless you, you, you are from a college, one of the four colleges that we didn't pick up any students coming from those colleges, your students know about it. Whether it's someone at your campus linked it, um, whether your DE coordinator linked it, or whether a student, one student told another student from a different college and they went in there and put in your, the college, your college as their home college and they went in there and used it. That's really great news because if it's, even if it's not being advertised, it's clear that the students are finding out about it. So we really liked seeing that number um, because we know students are accessing it. So what I would like to encourage um, you all, if, for those of you who are not familiar, or even if you are familiar because you've heard about it or you've attended one of our other presentations, if you're not sure how it's accessed on your campus, your starting point would be, I would say, speak with your DE coordinator. Find out if it's it, the, the created it and it's been linked or they have access to it. And if you don't, if they don't and would like to have access, contact us and we will share the information in terms of how to integrate it into uh, Canvas. I mean, the Creative Commons piece tells it very clearly, but we did write it up as documentation and shared it out with them previously. But again, that was at the end of uh, 2019. So they may or may not still have that information. We will share that information with you. You can just contact us and we'll, we'll forward that. And you can work with your campus administrator or DE coordinator to, to make sure it's there. But um, know that your students are using it. Know that your students are seeking out the information. And, um, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing because uh, as, as Laureen pointed out, we still have colleges who don't have health services. And at the very least, if we can provide the resources, right, and the resources that are coming from the expertise with, you know, with the expertise of the, your, your system colleagues, um, knowing the California Community College students, then this is, a, this is a really good thing because the students are getting the help and the services that they need at the very least um, in, in accessing Wellness Central. Next slide. And I just want to kind of go over those, uh, you know, as Laureen was pointing out, there's some key um, uh, services that are repeated throughout the modules and they're repeated for a very good reason, right? And we found like when we were uh, <laughs> listening to Dr. Farris, uh, Ashley Farris, that's the, the instructor who incorporated it into her course, she, she gave feedback about um, that you know, she asked the students questions like, what did you find is helpful? And this was one of the areas that the students found helpful, um, at least some of the feedback, that they could actually get immediate services, you know, and, and we're providing that information directly in there. So the, these kinds of things, we wanted to make sure that this wasn't just where students are just reading about stuff or looking at a video about stuff, right? We wanted that when they're looking at it, reading it, seeking out information, and they recognize this may or may not be them, then we do the responsible thing of providing them with the services that you can now 
contact these people and then take it further and really work with the, the professionals who are there to help you take it to the next level. So we wanted to highlight these um, particular services that are part of Wellness Central because it, it, it's throughout the entire um, design and but it's designed that way very specifically and it seems that students are responding to it. So can you go to the next one? So this, again, this is another service. And, and one of the things we kind of want to really highlight, these are all free services. And in some instances, these are services from your system, the California Colleges Health and Wellness. That's through the California Community College and the Foundation of California Community College with the Chancellor's Office. So there are services that exist. And what we've tried to do with Wellness Central is really bring it together in one space so it's not sort of scattered as well and students can access it, right? So it's it's another one of the services that we feel that, are, that is really important to highlight. And that again is repeated throughout the modules. And the last one, Jessica, Cognito, as um, Laureen pointed out, this is another free one. Um, and anyone, teachers, faculty, staff, you know, um, to, it teaches you how to recognize mental distress, but it's, it's, a, it's a really great tool in terms of learning. So they can go in there. There's additional help in terms of training, right? And it's, it's again, it's free. So it's, a, it's another one of those um, services that we've sort of repeated throughout the module so that um, everyone can access it um, and, and really take you, make use of it. And then one of the last services that we, through CBC OEI, we've done particularly to the mental health part of things because Wellness Central is about the entire health, you know, health of the student, but we recognize this was prior to COVID and even more so now with COVID. We recognize that, um, you know, and you saw that slide, right? Where it was 2%, I believe had telehealth services prior to COVID, it's gone up but it, it has gone up by, by, you know, by, because by circumstance, right? The COVID situation forced everyone into the online environment. However, being forced into the online environment doesn't mean that you suddenly know how to counsel and or provide mental health services in the online environment. And I know everyone is doing the best that they can. And so what we've done prior to COVID, we were preparing because we, we the online education initiative, our goal was always to prepare uh, student services for working in the online envir environment because we've always seen it as an equity issue. It has always been an equity issue. Anyone who's taking online classes um, need to have online support. Uh, so we designed these courses so that we can help mental health counselors in the system to learn how to counsel in the online environment. Not learn how to counsel because you've had that training, you know it better than anyone. Um, but how to do it in the online environment where it focuses on the ethical and legal guidelines, understanding how to maintain the integrity of your profession by ensuring that the platform you're using is HIPAA compliant and not just any old platform. And there's a reason why, you know, um, learning the, 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 the laws about treating across state lines and how, what that looks like in the online environment and things like that. So we have, um, a self-based course right now, but we've had and will be having um, a, a, a live, when I say live, an online course that will have a facilitator. And we really encourage, it's taught the facilitators are uh, um, mental health expert books from the, from the California Community College System who teaches the course and, um, and who designed the course. And it really, we really encourage you all to, to, to look at the course and take the course because it's very, helpful and useful to understand how to provide counseling in the in the online environment and most importantly how to maintain the integrity of your profession so it's not just a, well i can pick up the phone and talk to someone on on the phone that's that's not that's not the the ideal right we get that we want to help and that may be something that you have to do but when you have to do that what does that look like so these courses we we make these available um, it's through our at one site. If you go to um, at one, and I think Karen, if you can put the link, you'll be able to find these courses if you're interested, or if you are not uh, the mental health counselor, you may want to share that with your um, with your colleagues at the campus. And um, we really encourage you guys to take a look at those courses. So, in the last slide, what before I introduce Arnita, I wanted to to 
talk about this particular slide because it, it ties in very well in terms of um, introducing uh, what Arnita is going to sort of talk about with regards to equity. You know, one of the things we noted as we were um, looking at what is happening with mental health, uh, the, the gaps that is reported in terms of students and services. If you know, you, you would see all the other services and they're all relatively high. But what is interesting about this particular um, slide is that schools, the California student report shows a gap between what exists and their needs, right? So students are saying, I need, and I'm focusing now on health services, so the two, the 76 and the 74, they're saying what would be helpful, 76% are saying mental health services, counseling services, and emotional or psychological services. School is doing this, 35%. Now you may all, schools may be saying, wait a minute, I'm doing it, right? Now this is the students who are saying, it's like my school isn't doing it. So they're saying I need this, but only 35% of the students feel like their school is doing it. And you may wonder like, wait, that's not true. My school is doing it. How is that possible? What that tells me is that there's a disconnect between how students find out about your services, right? Or knowing that the services exist, as well as it, you may not be doing it, right? I, I feel because of what has happened with COVID, everyone is doing some version of it. But the truth of the matter is the students are feeling as if it's not being offered. So either it's not advertised in a way that is very visible to students, or it's, um, you know, the, the students can't find it because maybe it's buried deeply, you know, on the web page or, or, or something like that, or maybe the school isn't doing it. So these two pieces here, when you think about well-being services like mindfulness meditation services and all of those health services, and when you think about that, when you think about it in terms of equity, right? and what students need, that's 76% of our students. And you think about our student population, think about who's lacking in getting access and, and in terms of knowing that the services are there. So when we think about things like Wellness Central and any other kind of health services that students need, particularly in this time, and the fact that there's a disconnect between what the students are saying they need and what they believe is being offered, that is something to really think about. Right, And so we really want to encourage you all to, to go back to your campus, think about how you're offering those services and where they're being advertised and how much, how front and center if they're being advertised and maybe starting with Wellness Central and looking at the toolkits and seeing how you can make that more accessible to students so that we can get at all students who have the need for, for um, using uh, these kinds of services. And so now what I would like to do is turn it over to Arnita Porter, who's going to have a discussion with you guys about equity in terms of all these health services that we've been talking about and, and um, particularly mental health. But um, I think you'll be very interested in what Arnita has to say. So Arnita. Thank you. Well, my camera. Okay, I think we're here now. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bonnie. And um, I'm really excited about being here, uh, sharing this moment with you all today. Um, I echo the gratitude extended by Jessica and Lauren, um, Lauren, I'm sorry, and Bonnie, um, and the acknowledgements that were made. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm sitting in Inglewood um, on Tongva land. And I just want to um, acknowledge, you know, whose land I'm on and pay my respects as we get into this conversation. Um, so again, my name is Arnita, um, Arnita Porter, and uh, social justice is at the center of my practice as an educator, as an artist and cultural worker, and an attorney with a background in public policy. And I work for equity at the intersection of race and culture and gender. And um, if we can go to um, the uh, slides. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. So I like um, grounding um, you know, the work that we do together using 
uh, the fourfold way. And it's basically a guide for centering the work and focuses on principles of mindfulness, um, being present to the moment, um, and looking at things like, and um, you know, how are we showing up? So the goal is to show up and be present in what we're um, engaging in in the moment, and to you know, pay attention to what has heart and what has meaning, what resonates with you, and also you know, tell the truth, you know, be able to tell the truth without blame, um, without judgment. Um, and, you know, don't be attached to any results, just be open um, to outcomes and possibilities, but not necessarily attached to them. So as we do this work, I'm going to the next slide, Jessica. As we, as we do this work, I think it's good to be, you know, grounded, um, in these principles because it helps us not only to center the work, but it allows us to bring humanity into the room. And oftentimes when we're having conversations and there's data shared and, and tools, all things that are wonderful, um, but we're caught up in what we're doing. And I think it's good to bring um, how we do things into the conversation and, and, and ground the work. So this helps to create bridging um, and it helps us to establish a culture of caring and community with us asking in the very beginning, you know, how are we doing? Because we're tasks um, with our wonderful positions of helping to um, take care of our students and um, help them in terms of, you know, of supporting them in their wellness um, on their road to wellness when they're not feeling so okay. But also we're tasked with holding up the institutions that we work for in the departments. And so we want to make sure that we're bringing a culture of caring and community into the work um, because it's a lot right now. Um, and again, the tools that have been shared and the data that has been shared um, is, is great because it helps us to support our students, but we're also, um, experiencing this ourselves. We have families, we're exhausted, we're tired, we're overwhelmed. And so how do we, in the face of all of this and the understanding of this, how do we keep moving forward um, with the understanding that our goal is to provide the support that our students need? And so in that, we're looking at, you know, managing the emotional temperature of what's happening right now when we talk about this social aspect of help, um, of health. Sorry, so you can go to the next slide. So when we're looking at, um, you know, the social impact of what's happening and how, what impact is having on our social health, ours, our students, our institutions um, overall. And so we're having to, you know, examine <clears throat> what's happening at the same time, figuring out how do we exist in this? How do we exist in this pandemic? What do we do when we look up and we see folks storming the Capitol? Um, oh my God, the world's on fire. You know, how do we manage all of this and stay calm and present to it so that we can make sure that we are there providing the best services for our students while holding up these institutions um, that are places for us to do this work. But, um, you know, as Bonnie discussed, that we have to take a look at this gap. Um, the gap in the services that has surfaced based upon um, our students' voices. And so the question becomes, how are we listening to them? You know, and what are we hearing? And then how are we responding? And where is that disconnect? And where is that disconnect reflected in the work that we're doing? Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, my focus is on equity in health services. And of course, the social part that Lorraine spoke about um, and that Bonnie referenced as well. So this um, 2019 report on student mental health services, um, you know, surfaced some information for us. Information that I think we, you know, already know because we've been doing this for a while. So we know that the, the disparities exist, but, this particular report, um, 
you know, surfaced a need for culturally competent mental health care. And it found that two thirds of our students um, identify as a race or ethnicity other than white, um, but there are disparities between our students um, who carry marginalized identities um, and um, other students that they're compared to, white students. And so um, we're looking at the fact that students who carry marginalized identities have less access to services. They're less likely to be referred to mental health services, less likely to receive high quality service and less likely to continue treatment. And so we have to unpack that. We have to ask questions around that. Why is this? One of the things that I think helps to put this in the con into context, just to give a quick example. Um, you know, our beloved Hank Aaron um, just made his transition. And, um, you know, all over the news, everywhere, everyone talked about how great his career was. And, they focused on just how outstanding it was and how he overcame all of the racism that he had to do, that he had to endure and how he overcame that and still was able to be, you know, one of the greatest of all time. Um, and, you know, even he talked about when he was approaching that Babe Ruth record, um, how he had to have armed guards. He couldn't stay in the um, same hotel as his colleagues. And so the conversation was about how wonderful he was able to endure all of that. And he had the strength to endure all of that and was able to concentrate enough to still, um, you know, break that record. But for me, the conversation should take into account um, why was he having this racialized experience? You know, why were those systems in place that he was forced to overcome? Why were these obstacles there and everyone knew that these obstacles were there and it was okay? It wasn't about removing those barriers or breaking down those systems. It was about how he was able to overcome these systems. And so I think it's important to bring that into the conversation. We have to look at barriers are definitely present, but then what is the work that we're engaging in to help remove those barriers and what informs our practices so that we can really address those barriers in a way that's sometimes really uncomfortable for us. Um, but we have to understand that systems are in place and they're doing exactly what they were designed to do. But the question is, how can we look at those systems through a critical lens, through a critical race lens, through um, a cultural humility lens, through an equity lens, how can we um, look at these systems so that we can do the work of dismantling them and reimagining them and putting systems and practices and policies in place that are going to help us serve our students in a way that um, we don't have to you know, look at how are they overcoming these barriers. So with that being said, if we can move to um, the next slide. Thank you. With that being said, I think it's good, you know, that we have, you know, this understanding of what equity is. And we know that it's a state of fairness, um, impartiality, um, being just. Um, but we also know that we have to look at it, you know, structurally. You know, what does it look like systemically? And if equity is not in place, then what are we doing to make sure that we are? And I just want to, you know, jump real quick to say we're still struggling with equity, but now because of, um, you know, us experiencing 50 years in the time span of a week with things moving so quickly, you know, now we've moved to being anti-racist as a result of the George Floyd incident. So the question is, you know, how do we do all of this? And what is it that we're using to inform our practices? Next slide, please. So I want, you know, to consider some questions as we move through this. I know I'm talking quickly, but this information will be provided for you and hopefully we'll have opportunities to, you know, go in depth 
um, with these topics, but I want to be mindful of the time. But looking at some of these questions, you know, what was the culture before the pandemic? What was the culture before George Floyd? What kind of conversations were we having? And who was in those conversations? Who was being centered? You know, was everyone's um, history and traditions and humanity being acknowledged and centered? And were we comfortable really talking about equity? And now we're being forced to talk about race. But really, as um, Dr. Ben Simone says, you can't really have authentic conversations about equity until you do have conversations about race. And so, you know, still the question is, well, how do we do this? Because it makes us uncomfortable. Um, so how are we doing things differently now as opposed to what we were doing before all of these things um, were brought to the surface? Again, always been there but there was not always a willingness to talk about these things um, in a real authentic way. And um, just not being able, you know, not being sure about what to do about it. So it, it brings us to sometimes just attending conferences and conversations and just saying, just tell us what to do, help us check the box, but it's deeper than that. And so we really have to look at our work and how do we approach these subjects in a way that's really going to benefit our students? Next slide, please. Um, so some of the other things that we have to look at is, you know, how are we languaging our students? How are we languaging their experiences? Are we doing this, you know, through a deficit mindset? Are we being equity minded? You know, what are the terms and the labels being used to describe our students? Um, you know, are they underserved? Are they non this? And, um, you know, all of the, the words that we use, and we understand that we do this because having a shared language helps us to just jump to the work that we need to do. So there's, you know, a meeting of the minds, as we say, in the legal field. And so that we have an, a shared understanding of what we're talking about. But we also have to look at how language is also, um, it also creates trauma. And so looking at our language, what does that mean for our students? And what does it mean for us in the academy and in these um, professions where we're seeing that the language that helps to make up the policies and the practices, it has words, you know, that trigger us. And so what are we doing to shift this language? How are we um, able to communicate in a way that says we're not seeing students as less than. Because we know that that dates back to these practices of seeing certain segments of society, certain communities as less than, as less than human, if we take it all the way back um, to the constitution and the three fifths um, compromise, but I digress. But I want to just make sure that we're um, being mindful of our language, that we're being mindful of how we language our students and how we talk not only to them, but about them. And then what does that mean when we're engaged in conversations with them and we're looking to shape policies and practices that will support them? We got to do some soul searching to see what do we really think about them because the language speaks to what we think and it speaks to what the institution and what the system thinks about them. So if we're boots on the ground doing this work, we've got to examine all of our practices um, and apply uh, a lens to these practices that is going to really look at how do we reimagine these things that are becoming more and more apparent to us. Um, I also want to just touch on real quick, you know, looking at how are we leaving our students feeling about things when we talk to them, when we engage with them, um, because that's important. We, we know that we, they need to be safe. And so being safe means that you're establishing trust. So how are we doing that? And if we're looking at, you know, institutional practices and policies that kind of set up hierarchies and things that don't necessarily allow for creating trust with each other, let alone with our students. So how are we really doing this work? Next slide, please. 
And again, we're looking at the lenses that we're seeing things through and understanding that intersectionality is very real. And so our students might appear to be one thing, but there's so many other dynamics at play that we have to be aware of and informed about and understanding how our practices can trigger you know, the trauma that our students are already experiencing, that we all are experiencing on some level, but what lenses are we using to shape how we engage with our students and how do we leave them feeling? Next slide, please. And that being said, with us looking at um, things that are surfacing now as a result of the pandemic and George Floyd and all the George Floyds and Breonna Taylor's before him and her. Um, but really looking at oppression and how our systems, keep in mind systems do exactly what they are designed to do. And so we have to look at where is the oppression, how does that show up in our system that allows us to keep these, uh, keep doing these practices and engaging in this, these practices that keeps surfacing gaps, right? The gaps keep showing up. So at some point we have to accept what Bonnie said earlier, there's a disconnect. And so where is that disconnect and how do we surface that? But then are we brave enough to do the work to eliminate that disconnect? And that means we gotta get real about some things. We have to look at oppression and we have to look at the fact that there is systemic oppression built into our systems, whether you're in education, law, um, housing, every institution of our society, oppression is built in. So what are we doing to look at that? The beliefs, um, the, the interactions, um, the organization, you know, the policies, the structure of it. What are we doing to really surface that so that we can um, you know, make these practices that we engage in with our students ones that are trauma-informed, an understanding of what our students go through on a daily basis, and how can we eliminate that and help them to move um, towards being successful in their educational pursuits. Next slide, please. So we have to really take a look at racism. We have to look at what that is. We have to look at structural racism. We have to see how this shows up everywhere. And again, how can we work towards um, you know, really looking at these inequities and where they come from and how we can do the work to um, eliminate them. Next slide, please. And this is just going a little bit deeper into how you know, racism and all of the other isms, how does it show up? You know, are we really looking at things like white supremacy, preferential treatment, privilege, power, access, networks um, and who has access to what networks and what does that look like? And we saw with the information that was presented before that you know students that come from certain marginalized communities don't get access, don't get referrals, don't get um, the type of care. You know, we just experienced a doctor who um, talked about and shared information about the fact that she was a doctor and she's sharing information with her um, care team and how no one was listening to her. No one was taking her seriously. Um, what was that about? You know, and we have to look at that because we know that when it comes to um, certain areas and the traditions in those areas, people from marginalized communities are not taken seriously. And that is why cultural humility, as a, as, as a matter of fact, was, was created by a couple of doctors in the Bay Area who um, saw that, again, certain folks from certain communities coming into clinics and, and, and um, medical offices were not treated the same way. If they were black or brown, it was, uh, they received a kind of treatment that said that they didn't necessarily know what they were talking about. But if, um, you know, folks from um, white communities came in, then there was a certain acknowledgement of, of, of their um, um, knowledge and who they were. 
but those types of practices were not extended to um, folks coming from black and brown communities. So again, we have to look at how are we extending uh, care and how, what does that social health look like? What do those practices look like? And what are we using to inform our practices? Next slide, please. I'm gonna move very quickly because I know that we have to have some time for um, Q and A. But again, look at othering. You know, we know that racism and all the other isms creates this, um, you know, practice of othering. And so that means that trust is not in place. That means that um, it's us versus them. And so we have to look at how that shows up in our practice. Next slide, please. I follow the work of um, Dr. John Powell. He's a civil rights, um, he's just my guru actually, equity, um, um, civil rights. He is over the Othering um, and Belonging Institute out of Berkeley, which used to be called the Haas Institute. But one of the things that he says is that the problem of othering is the problem of the 21st century. And we're seeing it being played out every day. And so he talks about these practices of moving towards belonging, that the opposite of othering is not saming, not treating everybody as if they're the same. It's creating situations, environments where everyone belongs. So I encourage you to look at his work and go to um, the othering and belonging. Um, it's otheringandbelonging.com, I, I believe it is. But just check out his work. Next slide, please. And again, you know, I just want to comment on how now everyone is moving towards becoming anti-racist. And um, I think we also have to examine that because it's necessary, but we're also looking at over 400 years of oppression and racism and systemic racism. And that cannot be dismantled in a two hour workshop. It's impossible. So we really have to, you know, Take a look at how serious are we about this work? How authentic are we being? Are we looking to just check a box or are we really looking to dismantle these systems and reimagine them in a way that creates um, um, an environment where everyone feels like they belong, where everyone does belong and that is rooted in trust and belonging. Uh, next slide, please. And um, you can go back and review this, but um, Dr. Powell talks about the difference between breaking and bridging. And bridging is the thing that leads us to belonging when we're acknowledging the humanity of all. And when we're bringing this into our practice and, and treating each other with respect, we're using empathy and compassion and other um, you know, deep listening and other tools that help us to establish this trust so that we can really um, reach our students so that they can feel safe with us and um, be vulnerable with us so that they know that we're here to support them in their healing, in their wellness, um, and that we can even be vulnerable with them. And that sets up bridging rather than breaking, which is based on you know, hierarchies, other groups, us versus them, um, and those types of notions that go back to the history of systemic oppression. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to make sure that we looked at some of these equity sensibilities and everything didn't translate on the slide, but I will just, um, and I apologize for that. But what I will do is just say that we're looking at, you know, using certain tools that help to, um, you know, enhance our equity sensibilities. Cultural humility is something that I mentioned. Mindfulness, being trauma informed, deep listening, calling in versus calling out, you know, belonging. Um, being equity minded, empathy, building trust and bridging as well as um, belonging. And just a quick notion, uh, a quick note on the calling in versus calling out. Society right now is in this whole calling out um, space where it's important, but we also have to look at how are we calling each other in? And that is how are we showing appreciation for one another? How are we affirming our humanity and how are we inviting others to share their perspectives with us and, and engage in these difficult and challenging conversations so that we can move forward. 
And next slide, please. And I will end. I just wanted to say that um, um, Dr. Maya Angelou said that, you know, people um, will forget what you said, but they will never forget, you know, they'll forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And I think when our practices are informed with equity sensibilities, we're going to move towards helping our students um, in their journey to um, wholeness and well being. Thank you for um, your time and for letting me share this moment with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Anita Porter. Um, now I, I know we're at time 1230. I just wanted to make sure that you um, can, can see in the chat, we did try our best to share all of the links that were referenced today. We will also follow up with um, the recording link and uh, all of the information that we've shared today. We will share the PowerPoints. I did wanna take an opportunity to still, if you have time, if anybody has any questions that they want to share with us now, this is a great time. You can unmute yourself and um, um, feel free to ask any questions to anyone on our panel. I apologize for going over time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So I'll just kind of leave it open. Uh, if anybody has questions, feel free to jump in. Uh, thank you for all of the, the thank yous in the chat. We truly appreciate that. Uh, just a little quick note as well. Um, you can email us at support at cvc.edu if you have any questions uh, or need anything from our team. Please also visit our cvc.edu website. We have an events calendar. You can keep an eye out for any other webinars or events that we will be hosting. And again, uh, we will share all of the information. Uh, just give us a few days to get the uh, recording captioned and ready to go and ready to be shared. So again, thank you so much. We'll stay on for a bit if anybody has any questions for us. Yes, there's a question in the chat that I, I would like to answer. Someone asked oh, yeah. if if there's an error or need for a correction on Canvas, who could we message? So I am assuming you're talking about Wellness Central. So if you downloaded, if your campus downloaded Creative Commons, then your, your college will have to fix that because that's your own instance. So you're downloading the template and then they'll be able to work on it. If you're linking to the cvc.edu wellness and you note an error, just let me know. My email is bpeters at cbc.edu and we'll fix it. We try to pay attention to make sure that everything's up to par, but you know, something, something can happen, something can happen to the link. So you can let us know that way. But if, if you have downloaded the Creative Commons site, your, your Canvas administrator would be the one who will have to fix that. Wonderful. And I know there was another question in regards to any recommendations for, um, does anyone have specific trainings or diversity on diversity that they would recommend? Awesome, so I see Lori um, replied and then Arnita recommended a book. So yes, definitely. And you can, um, again, send us an email. We can, we're happy to, to get back as well. Great. And we did have a poll. I don't know if we're out of time, but I see that there's still about 36 um, participants in the room. Karen, if you wanna go ahead. If anybody's well, uh, willing to give us some feedback, this is really helpful to us as well. Uh, gives us a chance to uh, revisit the topics that we are um, choosing for webinars. And um, yeah, your, your feedback is definitely very helpful to our team. Oh, another question. How do we convince our counseling department to integrate this? Uh, again, I'm assuming we're talking Wellness Central, right? Um, you know, it, it starts, I think, with your, if you do have health and wellness services on your campus, it starts there. And the reason why I'm saying that is um, your, if you have a, an established department, a couple of things. They most likely, your director coordinator would have um, heard about it through HSACCC, right? Um, and being part of that organization. And that organization, as we, we've, um, we've, we've mentioned, this was a partnership. 
So it's it's really <laughs> their work. It's it's you know. So there should be no reason why um, they would not want to have it on uh, make be available at, at 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 their own college. So you start there because you'll get that support, right? You'll have someone who's on your campus saying, hey, this is something that we built and you know, and all of that. And then the second part is, I think when you, when you do that, it's colleague to colleague. So it would be like, if we're talking general counseling now, I would see where health services is partnering with, um, uh, with the general counseling to say, hey, can you guys put a link on, on your website, on your website to make referrals? Because in counseling, I used to do uh, general counseling. We always had that partnership for everything else because we would make referrals back and forth. So I think start there, start with your health and mental health services and see what they know and um, do a partnership with them and then bring it into general counseling. Awesome. I know another comment as DE coordinators, we are tempted to add it to our rubric aligned template for individual instructor uh, designers to make that decision. In a sense, it is unfair to not offer it to our students. Thank you. Awesome, she said, thank you, we will do that. Yes, Wonderful. great. Great, okay, so thank you everyone. Um, and I just wanna wish you all a, rest, a wonderful rest of your day. And um, okay, awesome. Wonderful, so thank you. Thank you so much for joining us again. Um, Please uh, look for a follow-up email with all of the resources and um, follow-up information.